I had a dear friend in politics whom Peter knew as well, Sir James Killen, and he had a say, if this is not a good story, we're in trouble. Well, here we go. You hear a lot of talk about asylum seekers. Here's one. Associate Professor with the exotic name, Munjid al Mudiris. He's joining Peter and me tonight. He has been through the system. He's a world-leading osseo-integration surgeon. Now, in layman's lingo, that mean he, means he implants titanium rods into the limbs of amputees and attaches robotic limbs. But he was born in Iraq. He fled to Australia by sea. He was held in mandatory detention in the remote north of Western Australia. He describes life there as hell on earth. Munjid has previously told the story of his early life in a book called Walking Free. Earlier this year, he released a new book called Going Back. And as the name suggests, it was about his return to Iraq at the invitation of the government to operate on military, police and civilian amputees injured in the war against Islamic State. He's now been back there seven times, most recently in April. This is a story that deserves to be told. And Associate Professor Munjid al Mudiris joins us here tonight. Wonderful. What a story. Can you believe all that? I can't believe it. I mean, you were born in Baghdad. What made you study medicine there? Um, thanks for having me here, by the way. And um, I wanted to study medicine since I was at the age of 12 when I watched the movie The Terminator. And I just was fascinated about the idea of having half human, half machine. And um, living in, in a war-torn country and seeing all these disabled people um, where they become um, a burden on the, on the society, I wanted to make a difference. And the best way to do it is through medicine. All right. Well, then, <coughs> your life changed forever in October 1999. You were 27. You were working in the Saddam Hussein Medical Centre in Baghdad and a senior army officer accompanied by soldiers arrived with three busloads of deserters and draft dodgers. And what did that senior officer say to you? He said that all elective surgery was to be cancelled and the deserters and draft dodgers were each to have one of their ears partly amputated by the order of Saddam Hussein himself. What did you do? Well, um, I just um, happened to be there on that particular moment, which was um, the most challenging moment in my life. The head of the department straight away opposed to the decision. Refused. And, yep. um, and he said, this is against the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm, and um, I'm not doing this barbaric act. And uh, straight away, they dragged him outside to the car park in front of everybody. They put a bullet in his head. Then they turned to the rest of us and they said, well, now we attracted your attention and you know that we're serious. Um, anyone share this man's view, come forward, otherwise proceed with our orders. Um, so I you had to choose. You dived into a locker room. <clears throat> so basically I had to choose between obeying the commands and live with guilt for the rest of my life, uh, refuse and oh. end up with a bullet in my head or um, hide and Can and you escape. remember now as you're talking to us what was going through your mind at that moment? Well, um, I just looked at my whole life um, of 27 years, living in a very comfortable uh, way, basically in a bubble isolated from the, from the war and everything, and all of that has vanished. And I knew straight away what I'm going to do um, hmm. is going to end up being me either killed or leaving the country. Leaving the country and leaving everything behind? Exactly. Everything behind? <clears throat> Family and everything? Well, unfortunately, that's the, that was the, uh, the case, and I didn't even get to ch get a chance to see my mum. Is your mum still alive? No, my mum passed away four years ago. But you did get to see her? I did get to see but her. But you eventually. got a bus, to, a bus to the Jordanian border, and you had these fake papers, which your cousin, I think was an army officer, got hold of them. That's correct. And then you had $22,000 in cash taped to your stomach. That was given to you by your mum? That's right. How did you end up on a boat to Australia? Well, from um, Iraq, I was smuggled through the borders to Jordan. Jordan was not safe, and the only 
country that would give an Iraqi national a visa, especially with half a decent passport, was Malaysia. Malaysia would give Iraqi nationals 14 days visa to um, uh, study English. So I decided to take that trip. And then sequence of events led to me meeting a people smuggler. I met two young so Iraqi men. So you met a people smuggler, am I right, in Kuala Lumpur? That's correct. Why, why didn't you apply for asylum in Malaysia? The problem with... Um, um, if you look at Malaysia or Indonesia or any of the countries that um, are um, um, route uh, or pathway through uh, where people can um, um, escape uh, f uh, through, uh, none of them are signatories to their um, Refugee Convention uh, Article um, or, uh, yeah, 1951. Yeah, but you're a doctor and um, you've come from a Muslim country. You've obviously got preference visa treatment into another Muslim country. Correct. Uh, you'd be much easier for them to take than someone perhaps like me. Um, so why, why didn't you apply? Malaysia doesn't, is not a signatory to the uh, no, no, refugee no, I'm not convention. Saying, I'm not saying um, refugee status, but what you were a professional, there'd be other classes of visa that you could have applied for. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't the case um, because Malaysia would give Iraqi nationals only 14 days visa. visa and um, there was an option of extension, um, but I never got a chance to, uh, to see that option. Uh, but you paid basically. the people smuggler 2,000 bucks, I think, if I remember <coughs> rightly, for Correct. the book. And you got a boat to Christmas Island. How many were on the boat? There were 165 people. They were crammed like sardines vertically. They, there was no space um, to sit down. And um, um, from that moment where we arrived in the lower shore of, um, of Java to an abandoned village, uh, there was no return, basically, because um, what people were promised was not what uh, they saw. And um, people were stripped of everything they had, and um, they were promised to be 50 on a, on, a, on a brand new boat. They ended up in a, in a leaky boat that's not And seaworthy. then you get into a detention centre. You said in the book, 10 months of imprisonment, 40 days of it in solitary confinement in Curtin Detention Centre in the northwest of Western Australia was hell on earth. That's right. In what way? Because I've been to Curtin. <sighs> OK. Uh, well, Curtin Detention Centre uh, was... Um, uh, back then was not prepared. Uh, we spent months in tents. Um, uh, I don't know what time you were there, but... I've been uh, to Curtin many times. OK. What year was it? All the way through the opposition years and in government. This was before the Olympics, though. That was before. Because you got released. So he got released. I think on the eve of the Olympic Games, two thousand. Yeah. So um, Curtin Detention Centre was um, uh, was opened in early 1999, uh, from my memory, and uh, we didn't have any facilities. There were army stretchers, um, uh, tents, and there was one tap water in the middle. Uh, people were uh, locked behind barbed wires uh, from within the main compound and um, head counted uh, from. 7 p.m. till 7 a.m. Um, um, four times a day, you have to you have to um, um, make, basically stand in the heat of the desert to be head counted. I can give you an example um, because I was um, um, singled out as a troublemaker. I spent um, significant time in Western Australian prisons, including maximum security jail. And uh, I can give you a comparison between the maximum security jail in Western Australia and Curtin Detention Centre. The Western Australian jail system is absolutely superb, and I recommend <laughs> it to everybody. <laughs> anyway, you were released <clears throat> on the eve of the Olympics, and you sent out, you say in the book, more than 100 resumes. And what, you got a job at Mildura, then at the Austin Hospital in Melbourne. So someone was impressed with your credentials. And then how did you end up in Sydney? Well, I, I managed to um, uh, basically... Uh, climbed the ladder very quickly. I passed my exams. Um, um, I was released um, on the 26th of August 2000, and I got my first paycheck as a doctor on the 1st of November 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, so it took me. Um, I, so were you already two trained months. in this osseo integration surgery? What sort of people do you perform that surgery on? Uh, osseo integration surgery is a, is a cutting edge technology. Basically, I was trained in Germany uh, uh, to do that surgery, and I did my training in 2008. That was way later. Uh, in my time um, after I finished training here in Australia. Um, but um, it, is, uh, it involves basically attaching high tensile strength titanium implant into uh, the residual limb of an amputee and um, reorganising the muscles and the nerves to operate on my electric processes. As simple as operating a Robocup. So in the new book, Going Back, I mean, Iraq invited you back. That's right, and um, that's something that I would never imagine. What did you think when you arrived after all the devastation? 
Um, when the plane was landing, I thought to myself, what the hell have I done? And um, I'm going back to the place that uh, I escaped from, and I didn't know what I'm going to expect, especially that um, Iraq changed from a, a secular dictatorship to a, a religious lunatic state. And um, uh, But then, uh, to be honest, my fears were dissipated uh, very quickly. They treated I you as a VIP. See, well, I could see that there is a lot of uh, genuine... Um, interest in having me there and um, and um, there is a, a huge need especially that Iraq had um, 185,000 amputees and um, did you find anyone from your previous uh, time in the hospital there when you went back a second time around? Um, interesting enough uh, the second day of my arrival I, I looked at a person who looked very familiar and um, and turned up to be an, a neurosurgeon um, that was in my class and um, um, he also escaped uh, from Iraq eventually and went to Germany and um, he was coming back uh, for a humanitarian visit to uh, do neurosurgical procedures on on people but a hundred and fifty you say in the book a hundred and fifty thousand amputees from 40 years of war, and I think you say in the first day you saw 90 patients. That's right, it was um, almost 95, uh, 95 patients, I think. Gosh. Well, and half the people you recommended for surgery, say, decided against having it. That's right, and uh, we and the other half, we decided they are not suitable the because the unknown, they were... They didn't. Um, um, because they were smokers, and, um, and then we decided that you know, we, we're not going to end up operating on anyone. Um, so, um, so we started treating smokers as well. We tried to apply the same standards that we have here in Australia. And um, eventually, um, after seven visits, we managed to operate on uh, almost 500 patients. But you'll never be able to, I suppose, provide the kind of surgery to everybody who needs it. Well, I think um, it... Um, I started a nucleus of um, uh, of something that can snowball because a lot of people are following the same uh, footsteps. Um, the um, the hospital that I'm working at uh, has uh, had a great deal of funding now uh, from the government uh, with mm. the influence of um, the um, the publicity that we received uh, over there. And, keep uh, going back. and um, uh, well, if they let me in until the day they someone might kill me over there. Uh, obviously, I created a lot of um, uh, problems there because uh, uh, there is a big trade for expatriating Iraqi p uh, patients um, overseas to neighboring countries like Iran, and, um, and there is a lot of commissions get paid. While, while I go there, um, you know, I do it for free. So I, I, and wherever you go, you discover that there is a lot of business going on um, in these areas and, right. and people make a lot of money from wars. Well, it's... what's the feeling on the ground with ordinary Iraqis <clears throat> now? You know, do they feel like they're over the worst of it and they're trying building their, rebuilding their country? Look, um, Iraq went, went through major changes. Um, uh, for 35 years, Iraq was under the, sec uh, the secular dictatorship of Saddam Hussein. It was a, a pure dictatorship and uh, there was one Party, one regime. Then all of a sudden, America invaded, um, uh, and um, and everything turned upside down. And unfortunately, uh, the um, destruction of uh, the Ba'ath Party uh, regime uh, left a major vacuum that mm -hmm. could only be filled by local uh, religious leaders. And um, um, the West fell in the traps, uh, where there was a very poor advice by uh, by. Uh, Paul Bremer to, to give power to religious leaders who didn't have any influence in the Iraqi mm -hmm. um, uh, public. Oh, so, yeah. so what happened is that um, um, the masses, um, uh, basically the poor uh, class, the ill-educated, uh, you know, um, wrapped around the religious leaders and ended up with um, um, the rise of um, uh, sectarian violence. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, that's all told in the book. It's called Going Back... It's Associate Professor Munjud al Madiris, a wonderful man, an asylum seeker, I think you'd call him. It's called Going Back. It's published by Alan and Unwin, and the first book's called Walking Free. Good luck. Thank you for what you do, and thank you for sharing it with us. Thanks for having me. Isn't that wonderful? What a story, eh? Ah, amazing story. Mm, gee, it makes us feel pretty insignificant in the scheme of things, I think, when you've got people like that.